Now we're going to talk about a couple of other important figures in the golden age of comics. But before we do, I want to talk a little bit about Roy Thomas, who uh, actually was just uh, barely uh, just barely managed to be born in the golden age, 1940. Uh, he would go to work for Marvel Comics in 1965, having before that um, gained recognition for his many letters that he wrote in to Marvel Comics in the early 60s. And in 1973, would uh, take over from Stan Lee as editor-in-chief. And there's a lot of things that Roy Thomas has, has done and worked on, and we'll be talking about him more later when we get to the Silver Age. But there's a connection to the Golden Age as well, in large part because of uh, when he was born, 1940. That means that his formative years, all the way up through his uh, pre-adolescent years, were the, the Golden Age of comics and of pulp magazines, and he had... Uh, he had quite an attachment to a lot of the characters from his from his childhood. Uh, just one example of a character that he would create in the 1970s that has a sort of a golden age echo to it is uh, the martial arts character Iron Fist, whose origin is virtually a reworking of the public domain uh, origin of Amazing Man by Bill Everett from 1939. In addition, Roy Thomas in the 1970s and 80s reintroduced a lot of those World War II era heroes to a new generation, which would include me. Uh, in the 1970s at Marvel, he had a book called The Invaders, uh, which starred the uh, timely comics World War II heroes focused on Captain America, Human Torch, and the Submariner, but would also include several of the, the, the more minor, uh, lesser ones, like, uh, like the Mighty Destroyer. And uh, he did that until the early 80s, at which point he moved over to D.C. and had a book called The All-Star Squadron, in which he did the same thing for the, the D.C. characters from the World War II era. In fact, he managed eventually to include in that book which ran 67 issues, I guess, through the 80s. Uh, he managed to include every character from World War II, superhero character, that, that DC owned, both back at that time and that they had bought since, like Plastic Man and Phantom Lady and so forth. In addition uh, to reintroducing some of those World War II heroes, he also reintroduced some other things from his childhood, he was the uh, motivating force in 1970 to uh, convince Marvel to get the uh, licensing rights to the character Conan the Barbarian that he remembered from the uh, pulp uh, magazines as a kid. And he brought back a lot of other, other pulp figures as well. So Roy Thomas, you could say an honorary Golden Age writer. Now let's talk about someone who was actually working with Golden Age characters during the Golden Age. Mort Weisinger and Julius Schwartz. These, uh, these guys the, in the photo here, the photos, this is them as they looked in the mid to late 1940s. But in the early 1930s, they were a couple of uh, Jewish high school students in the Bronx who were both both sons of, of immigrants. Weisinger's parents were from Austria and Schwartz's parents were from Romania. And they, uh, they were both very enamored of science fiction pulp magazines and science fiction in general. And in fact, they both got, uh, got involved in fan clubs, <clears throat> national fan clubs for uh, for people, for devotees of, of science fiction. And in 1932, along with uh, uh, Forrest Ackerman, whom they had uh, met not in high school because he's from Los Angeles, but uh, as part of their fandom, uh, the three of them plus Forrest Ackerman started their own fanzine called The Time Traveler, science fiction's only fan magazine. 
fan magazine, also known as a fanzine, right? It's the same thing, same kind of thing that uh, uh, Siegel and Schuster uh, did their Superman stories in, where they were mimeographing the pages. It's a non-professional um, publication put together by fans. And this was, in fact, it was not the first fanzine, but it was the first fanzine exclusively devoted to science fiction. Uh, so they put this out for a while. Forrest Ackerman, by the way, would uh, would go on to be an editor of uh, science fiction pulp magazines and also the editor and main writer for Famous Monsters of Filmland, which was uh, around for decades, many decades, over half a century, and, and he was in charge of it for all that time. Forrest Ackerman, by the way, also the very first person and this happened in 1939, to cosplay at a convention. In 1933, Weisinger and Schwartz sold their first science fiction short story to Amazing Stories. 1934, Weisinger said to Schwartz, hey, you know what we ought to do? We should be literary agents uh, for science fiction writers because we know all the editors by this point of all the different pulp magazines around the country and we can help to target the right writers to the right magazines that would match up with them and uh, that's what they did they started a, a literary agency called solar sales service in 1934 which was the first literary agency to specifically target science fiction and fantasy and horror writers and uh, it was in business for about 10 years. And among their, among their clients were people like, uh, well, Otto Bender, that we've talked about already, and H.P. Lovecraft, one of the early 20th century giants of horror, and Ray Bradbury. So these guys were, you know, they were not pikers. This was a, this was a serious endeavor. Well, the agency was around for 10 years, but Weisinger was, was only part of it for the first four or five years or so because uh, he, he left uh, the agency and uh, went back to the pulps full time and got a gig in the late 30s as the editor of Thrilling Wonder Stories and by 1940 was uh, editing about uh, 40 different science fiction and fantasy and various other genre pulp magazines. Uh, Schwartz continued on with the literary agency. Weisinger then in 1941 got a job. Uh, he branched out. He got an editorial job at National Publications alias DC. His first assignment was more Fun Comics, number 73, where he was not only editor but had writing duties as well. Specifically, uh, he introduced some new characters into the lineup that he co-created, including Aquaman and Green Arrow. I say co-created. The artists uh, who were part of the, uh, the creation equation were, respectively, um, Paul Norris and George Papp. Weisinger was was drafted in 1941, so he was he was away from the office for about three years, like a lot of the other folks we've talked about. Julius Schwartz, meanwhile, 1944, followed in Weisinger's footsteps, leaving the literary agent business behind, and actually getting a job at All American Comics for for Max Gaines right before it was. Uh, completely bought out by by National. And of course, once the National Allied Publications, Detective Comics, and All-American all combined, it became National Periodicals. So anyway, by 44, Schwartz is also in what is about to become part of DC. And in 1945, 46 or so, I think it's 46, Weisinger returns from military service and resumes his job that he had had uh, briefly in 1941 as editor of the Batman and Superman titles. Now we're going to pick back up with Siegel and Schuster. 
A few months after Action Comics number one debuted and was a huge hit, Siegel approached uh, the uh, uh, national editors with, uh, with another idea. His idea was a, a series about Superman when he was a boy, when he was a little boy. And the idea would be that uh, little boy Superman would be extremely precocious and mischievous and always getting in trouble uh, with his powers, you know, with hilarity ensuing. And the editor said, no, thank you. Well, a couple of years later, 1941 or so, Siegel well, once again approached uh, the uh, approached editorial, and now that that was Mort Weisinger, with uh, similar idea, except not quite as as mischievous. Uh, and he had an entire script written out, a story treatment at least. And uh, Weisinger was like, "Yeah, well, all right, we'll get back to you," uh, and they never did. Uh, because it just seemed like, well, Weisinger felt like it would be irresponsible to portray Superman, who was, uh, you know, a positive role model, as a, a, a naughty kid, basically. So, they never got back to him. Then, uh, well, then actually, Siegel and Weisinger both got drafted. Then, January uh, 1945, the January-February issue of More Fun Comics, which would actually have come out in probably November, December of 44. Um, one of the stories in that issue, which was edited by uh, Jack Schiff, was a story about Superman when he was a boy that uh, had the artwork by Joe Schuster. Well... Uh, Schuster uh, sent a letter to Siegel, who was at that time uh, in uh, stationed in Hawaii, telling him, uh, telling him that uh, essentially they had used his story, but they had never told him they were going to. And that was, uh, to say the least, problematic for Siegel. Then the following year, uh, that same character of Superboy was. Uh, was brought to Adventure Comics to be the main cover feature and uh, quickly became really popular and uh, quickly also went from being like you know the 10 year old or, or whatever to the more familiar 15 16 year old Superboy that uh, that we've all seen in various iterations down through the years Finally, um, in April 1949, the now very popular Superboy got his uh, got his own title, um, Superboy Number One. Uh, but he was still in Adventure Comics. He was still the lead in Adventure Comics. And in fact, Superboy and the Legion of Superheroes would be the main feature in Adventure Comics for for decades to come, all the way up until the final issue. Issue 503 in September of 1983. And meanwhile, Superboy had become Superboy and the Legion of Superheroes. And uh, that continued until 1987. As I said, though, that was, that was viewed by Jerry Siegel and also by Joe Schuster as very problematic. As in their eyes, they created the character of Superman, now this derivative character of its Superboy was also going to be um, creating revenue for national periodicals slash DC. And Siegel's story, his concept, and his story for Superboy had been used uh, without, his, uh, without his permission. So 1946, Siegel and Schuster sued national periodicals slash DC. They sued them, they took them to court, uh, claiming essentially they had been defrauded that the $130 that they had been paid in 1938 was payment for their physical work, the actual act of uh, writing and drawing the issue, not for the work in the sense of 
the final product, the character, which is something that they had already developed before they brought it to national periodicals. Now, DC counter-argued that, uh, no, in fact, uh, even though they had a concept, they had to change that concept uh, at the behest of uh, Nationals editors. And so that made anything that resulted a work for hire. So I went to court, and the, the judge's eventual ruling, uh, the lower court judge's ruling, it was then appealed, uh, was that, um, well, he, he found in favor of national uh, periodicals, DC, on the Superman part, because the judge, the judge ruled that it was a, a work for hire. Uh, but he ruled against DC on the Superboy part because they had not firmly said no to Siegel when he had submitted the idea to them twice. They had not said yes or no, uh, really, the second time. Um, but they hadn't said yes, for sure. They hadn't said yes, and they published it anyway. And since the whole idea of Superman as a boy was clearly Siegel's, and since no contracts were, were drawn up to reward him for his story and his idea, that essentially everything DC made from Superboy should go to uh, Siegel. And so the lower, uh, the lower court uh, judge ordered, uh, ordered National to uh, draw up uh, a report of all their profits on Superman and Superboy. Well, Superboy was, like I said, popular enough that within a couple of years he got a second title. Um, what National did was they settled with Siegel and Schuster in 1948. In return for Siegel and Schuster acknowledging that National DC did have the rights to Superman and Superboy. They were paid $94,000 between them, which, adjusting for inflation in 2020 dollars, is around a million dollars. Okay, so a million dollars nowadays, not as much as it used to be, but still, uh, you know, it ain't hay. Uh, so they took that deal. Now, the way the copyright laws were set up back then and this would change i think in 1976 but the way it was before is that from the moment of creation the moment of publication copyright is held for 28 years and at the end of 28 years uh it had to be uh, renewed you had to apply for a renewal of copyright well siegel and schuster applied for the copyright to superman and Superboy in uh, 1966 when that 28 years was up and that went to court went to court and and dragged on for quite a while eventually however the court ruled that when Siegel and Schuster had taken money to transfer the rights or any claim to the rights of the character to DC way back in 1948. They had in fact been uh, relinquishing any claim on copyright present or future. So uh, essentially, you know, they get bupkis. Um, however, Siegel and Schuster continued to, uh, to complain and to talk to the press and both of them both of them were in in sore straits. I think that uh, uh, Schuster, well, he had a uh, um, a period there in the uh, 1950s when he was uh, secretly doing artwork for uh, underground uh, S and M magazines and publications. Um, eventually, I think he became a mailman, and and Siegel um, worked as a as a writer, but it was like a third, fourth string writer at Marvel, actually, in the early 70s. Um, 
There's a story of a, a new person uh, coming uh, and walking through the offices and saying, who's that old guy under the stairs typing? Oh, that's the guy that created Superman. Anyway, um, they continued to talk to the press and continued to get public support. And they also were getting a lot of support from the artist Neil Adams. We'll talk a lot about him later. He's probably the most popular artist at DC Comics in the early 1970s. Well, um, DC had been bought by Warner Brothers by that time. We're in the late 70s. And 1976, they were uh, uh, kind of laying the groundwork to, uh, to develop a big-budget motion picture about Superman. Uh, the special effects uh, industry was uh, advanced enough that they felt like they could do it without it looking hokey. And they were really going to, you know, really going to promote the heck out of this movie that they were starting to make. And these two old guys uh, standing on the street corner complaining about how DC had screwed him out of Superman were going to uh, be bad publicity. So 1976, DC makes another deal with Siegel and Schuster. And the deal was... They would be given credit the way Bob Kane, though not Bill Finger, had been given credit for Batman since 1939. Siegel and Schuster would uh, appear in every uh, every Superman comic book as created by Siegel and Schuster. Plus, they would be given a pension of twenty thousand dollars a year for the rest of their lives. And uh, that went up over time. I think it wound up being thirty thousand. Um, and that was uh, over a 20-year period for Siegel, who died in 1996, a 16-year period for Schuster, who died in 1992. Um, the movie came out and was a huge hit. It made $300 million for Warner Brothers slash DC, and it was followed with three sequels, each one uh, a little less good than the previous, although Superman 2 may have been better than the first one. Superman 4 was horrible. Uh, but all four together uh, in the 1970s, uh, for about a 10-year period from the late 70s through the 80s, made $500 million for Warner Brothers and DC. Schuster's family tried uh, one more time about a decade after his death uh, to uh, to file claim for an interest in Superman and Superboy, but in 2012, court ruled that all such uh, all such interests were negated if they ever existed with the uh, previous agreement between Siegel and Schuster and DC. So Superboy did okay, uh, showing up. Uh, in uh, 1946 in Adventure, getting his own title in 1949. But the fact is, he was on the, uh, he was coming in on the tail end of a declining game. And that declining game was Superheroes of the Golden Age. Once World War II was over, the, uh, the readership and what the readership was looking for kind of shifted. Uh, there had been four years of super gung-ho uh, patriotism and uh, all together for the war effort uh, kind of stuff. And these types of colorful figures really played well into that, uh, played well into, you know, the, the war bond drives and so forth. But, uh, but taste started to change. And it wasn't only in comic books, by the way. Same thing happened in uh, cinema, uh, for instance. After World War II was over, there was kind of, uh, in the movie going public, there was kind of a, uh, an ennui, kind of a boredom of the hyper-patriotic, uh, Manichaean, good versus evil sort of story that was uh, the stories that were told through superheroes and that type of mythology. And movies started to get a little darker. That's when film noir developed in France and in the United States. 
film noir being those really dark detective and crime stories where um, there are a lot of shades of gray so far as, you know, who is the good guy and who is the bad guy and what does all of it mean. Same thing was happening in Westerns. Westerns were getting more adult, by which I don't mean, you know, sexualized, but I mean a lot more sophisticated and nuanced. Uh, the, quote, psychological Western became the the in thing. You had heroes who were kind of anti-heroes. Um, and the same thing was kind of filtering down to... Uh, to the kids. Now, remember, a lot of grown-ups were reading comics, so uh, that number started to decline, but even those that did, whether they were grown up or not, um, were attracted to just other kinds of things. Superheroes had gotten boring. Now, Superman, and also Superboy, Batman and Robin, and Wonder Woman survived that uh, decline of the superhero and their titles continued uh, throughout uh, the end of the 40s and in, into the 1950s throughout the 1950s but the other characters the other heroes one by one fell by the wayside Captain America over at Timely and the Human Torch and the Submariner um, Dr. Fate the Green Lantern the Flash uh, the Justice Society, uh, the Justice Society of America, canceled uh, in All Star Comics in 1951. Um, Plastic Man, even Captain Marvel, who had surpassed Superman in popularity, was on the decline in 1953 when he gasped his last, and uh, Fawcett just kind of gave in uh, to DC and decided to go toward greener pastures. So. Superheroes who really had ushered in the extreme popularity of comic books. If they're out, what's going to be in? <laughs>